one hell of a time But the question on everybody's mind Where is the Welcome to Ideas Don't Bleed, a comics podcast presented by Ashcan Press featuring Matthew Rosenberg and the Supple Boys, Ethan S. Parker and Griffin Sheridan. This is part two of our discussion with Kelly Thompson about her career and her new comic series, Black Cloak. We hope you enjoy. Your, your aversion to, to sort of exposition and, and the like hand-holding world building is something I think about a lot because mm-hmm. we talked about it a lot when I was making What's the First Place from here and how I didn't want to do any handholding and wanted mm-hmm. to drop people into the world in the, yeah. in the same way that, and like, I see like, uh, I know that we both have an interest in that of just, of just telling the audience, like, keep up, like, like yeah. come along with us on a journey. Like when you need to know something, we'll tell you otherwise keep up. There's going to be yeah. some mysteries. There's going to be some unexplained things. Yeah. And um, it's actually funny because I, uh, I was thinking about you the other day cause I did a lettering pass on the first issue of wildcats. And uh, <laughs> there was a, there's a bit that opens the first issue. And I remember calling you or, or messaging you and being like, I'm thinking about doing this thing. And you were like, that sounds like it could have too much text and i was like no no i'll I'll keep it light and you were like it sounds like it's gonna be a wall of exposition and i was like no it's for this thing and you were like but i'm telling you what it sounds like and when i got it back i looked at it and like i just had you like over my shoulder that's too much text and literally like i feel so bad for our letterer because i went through and was like i cut half of it like i had a lettered version and i was like i cut half of it again just because you were you were there over my shoulder but i apologize to your letter no (laughs) but not to your readers your readers can send me thank you notes no it reads Mm -hmm. it reads it definitely reads Mm -hmm. better it definitely reads you know it it, there is there is an instinct to overwrite on my part all the time and i I find myself yeah and i find myself walking back the thing that that's interesting to me about it is the way when you talk about how you don't want to be holding people's hands the like uh, that sounds like a very sort of natural like you don't want to be exposition dumping on people but i think black cloak is some of the best world building i've seen in comics in years like i uh, it it blew me away the i I don't want to like that's give so too nice. much away. Well, yeah, okay, get over. Now, it. I, now I feel bad. I've been a dick so far. Like, yeah, who knew? that was the point. Yeah, it's uh, very but, clever. But I mean, I think there's a thing without giving too much away, and I feel like I'm not giving too much away if I talk about it because you can go pay for it now on your Substack, and people should go do you that. You can, and like the first fifty pages or something are free too. Yeah, so, so like, there's I, a big the, chunk that's there. The thing that blew me away is the way you handle the the lagoon and the mermaids and mm-hmm. just like the cops putting on the headphones oh. to go down there and yeah. it like you don't explain what the headphones are at first mm-hmm. and it takes a little bit and i was just like when the headphones come on i was like that's weird i like it i don't know what mm-hmm. it is great. and i yeah. and i didn't know if you were going to explain it when i first read it and i was like i like it if you don't explain it and i like it if you do <laughs> and then when you get the explanation and the mermaids it's so it's such rich world building and it's so immersive and smart and like so natural to the world. And then like the sort of beautiful moment of it is when uh, the black cloaks go and talk to those kids who hang out by the lagoon (laughs) and they're just such good characters because they're obsessed with the mermaids and they're just like, we like the mermaids. (laughs) And like, I was like, that's the way to do it. You've built this yeah. really smart, organic world, but the characters are then informed by interacting with that world and caring about it. And mm-hmm. it's not just, I think you fall, like people fall into these tropes of doing great character work where there's great characters who exist separate from the world and or doing great world building where the characters are just an afterthought in this great high concept science fiction, fantasy, whatever idea. Mm-hmm. But this was everything informing everything else in this mm-hmm. way that i mean it really reminds me a lot of saga it reminds me a lot of like the sort of great sci-fi fantasy comics we have where like it just feels like you're dropped into a world that's always existed in a way that that really makes a difference and Mm. 
so that's why I was curious about about whether the framework of the story came first or the the genre of the story. Mm. Um, but it makes sense to me that it's like, oh, it's things you love because it, it's also organic. It all mm. works so well that yeah, because because the, the not the not overwriting and over explaining is already like a trick. Like because if you're gonna establish such a big detailed world, it's like yeah, like to not explain everything is already a trick. But then to like make it something that people can open and look at and their head doesn't hurt. Like they're just like, oh, this is this and this is that. Like yeah. it all just like unfolds. I just feel like it operates on all those levels and yeah, it has that saga energy where it's just an entertaining character thing on top of all that. So yeah, yeah like it's, it's yeah, it works on all those levels. Thank you. I mean, Absolutely. I think some of that, and I, I think Matt is this kind of writer too, although you can tell me if I'm wrong, Matt, I think a lot of it just comes down to, I see my job as, so I'm usually so far the sort of first creator on the scene right the origin of the idea is coming from me but the huge development of what you guys anyone who reads it feels comes from the artist because mm -hmm. they're so i'm providing this roadmap right of what we're going to try to do and i'm giving them the script and hopefully the script is great hopefully it's very informative to them and it's also moving and it does these things we need it to do but it really all comes down to in this case meredith hmm. what she builds from what i give her and with meredith honestly there's not a lot of back and forth she's very she's very good like yeah. those those kids from that scene you guys are talking about mm -hmm. except for the kid with the the Jessup kid with the crazy sci-fi outfit, mm -hmm. those are all first passes. Yeah, and, amazing, the, wow. and the kid with the sci-fi outfit is a second pass. Mm -hmm. And I think my note was he is sort of the leader kid. Uh, we've established he's sort of the leader kid, but he seems the least cool to me. So I think, <laughs> we, gotta, I think we gotta judge him up somehow, like maybe give him a bit of a sci-fi outfit or something and then she came back with that i was like okay well now i want him in every scene it's too bad he's <laughs> yeah. a loser that i don't like you know so <laughs> she, she's just that good and then so then i feel like my job is hopefully not at the expense of the letter hopefully in the lettering pass i come in and i look at what she did and i go where are the places where we need less of me yeah. where mm -hmm have mm. less captions less explanation where does her work do more than enough emotionally mm -hmm. or structurally and we and let me get out of her way because yeah. i mean listen you don't end up with a cliche like a picture is worth a thousand words for no fucking reason it is yeah. it's more powerful we're more moved by that and i don't mean to say that words can't be incredibly powerful too i i do my best to put those things in there if they're not already there but mostly i want to get out of the way of the experience of the book and i just think that and so really the smartest the smartest and best move is when you're choosing who you're partnering with yeah. um and yeah, she's so, doing amazing work on this she's yeah. amazing i know meredith is not super famous in comic spheres and i feel like that is comics fuck up um mm -hmm. i know that her work is not always the most accessible like sometimes it gets exaggerated and cartoony in a way that some people have trouble with like it becomes almost a little bit abstract i love that about it yeah um you know in times where i feel like it's becoming too abstract those are times when i might try to do a little more with words to make sure that we're not losing any clarity but mm. i think her vision for things is really incredible and it makes I, me so excited to do it with her that's what she'll do you know yeah, the mm. thing the thing that I think is is brilliant about her, I think you're right that she gets abstract and and you know things get more or less cartoony mm -hmm. per scene or per page, but she knows when to do that masterfully, mm -hmm. um, yeah. mm -hmm. and that is a different talent than having you know a diverse style that can be than flow. I think the idea that like knowing when you when you can zoom in and just have when people can just be circles and things like that <laughs> yeah, and, like, yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. it's so it's so beautiful it's so well choreographed on her part um and you guys you guys worked together previously yeah we did heart in a box together at dark Horse. that was yeah. my first that was my first project i mean i'd done a short for um for uh that womanthology 
mm-hmm. book that Renee Tillis did years ago on Kickstarter. It was one of the big early Kickstarter successes. And I did a four page short with Stephanie Hahn, uh, who was doing my covers for my uh, self published novel. And so we sort of knew each other. So the first thing I ever did was draw by Stephanie Hahn. It's hilarious. Um, but uh, yeah, it was Heart in a Box was the first thing I ever did in comics. It ended up coming out a little after Gem started, which was my first sort of published monthly book, um, just because it takes so long and the paying comics is traditionally so bad that, you know, someone like Meredith can't just, you know, she'd starve if she was just working on a graphic novel on the side. Sure. So it took a while, but yeah. Um, and honestly, I, I got a bit of a late start compared to a lot of people I know, including Matthew here. Um, but I think I'm glad about it. I mean, I, I feel like if they'd had Kickstarter when I was 24, it would have been a disaster and I would have published a lot of really, really bad stuff. But, you know, I mean, for example, Heart in a Box was a, a book that I'd written in my mid 20s and uh, it wasn't until much later that I came back to it and it really transformed into something like it's, I mean, I think the Heart in a Box story is what you traditionally see it as like a very paint by numbers sort of about romantic love and through sitting on it for years and then coming back to it and rewriting it and working with Meredith I saw that it was just sort of more than that and I'm really happy about that and it makes me really proud that that's sort of my first work because when sure. I look at it now yes Meredith is doing most of the heavy lifting but other than some rewrite some I overwrote this page and maybe I didn't need that joke I don't have a lot of issues with it still which mm feels nice um sweet just real, a, real quick yeah. i have a, t- a technical step, step in yeah. yeah yeah i think uh kelly are you outside by chance I'm or not, have a fan a going fan. there is a fan yeah. alternate is that better um, i'm sorry whatever yeah, amount is is comfortable for you it, it was just kind of <laughs> in the microphone a little bit no no i'm there. sorry about that um no it's okay is that it's better? Hot, man <laughs> yes yes it is okay. is it hot in portland Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, hot. it's hot everywhere. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I got a question if, if we, if you want me to do that so we can kind of just get right back into it. Yeah. 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 I mean, whatever's best for you guys, unless you guys want to leave that in. Cause that was maybe a great moment. It's like real. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> mm. yeah. I'm sure the people will it sh- love it. It. Show, it shows that comic creators are just like us, you know, yeah. 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 not enough money. And They're hot. hot. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's going to be our post credit stinger. And then people Ooh, have to come that's back good. That next like time that. find out what happens. I don't know what um, that means, so I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're talking a lot about, uh, you know, Meredith's work, and uh, it is fantastic in Black Cloak. You guys have such a unique flavor of the sci fi fantasy stuff in there. Mm. And so Ethan and I are. are uh, doing design stuff with a wonderful artist right now so i want to hear yeah. about how did the look of everything come about how much of it is kind of coming out of your head kelly how much of it is just straight from meredith that you're sort of getting feedback on what was the design process like on such a unique look did, did any of it surprise you as being different from what was originally in your head yes Yes, Mm. especially because when I was first working on this back when it was called The Red a million years ago, Mm -hmm. I was actually even working with a different artist, another friend of mine. We had talked about it a little bit. Um, It ended up not really working out for a variety of reasons. But I mean, this is like a completely different book than that would have been. And Mm. a lot of that's down to the art, but a lot of it is also down to, you know, just years pass between that friend and I talking about it and you know you just change I mean I know I just said I'm pretty happy with my first work but you know if if I was doing heart in a box all over again it would be different I'm sure Meredith would say it would be different too you'd do it a different way um Mm -hmm. but I think that Meredith's really sort of clean sharp style Mm -hmm. meant it was even more important that I not overwrite it um because that could get overwhelmed really quickly i think that that art um i think that i think her colors are incredible and that was a big thing that we wanted from the jump like 
there are many more ways that this feels like a fantasy book because of all the creature stuff and because there's magic. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. you immediately go to, oh, it's fantasy. But we wanted to, to have, I mean, it's got its roots more in like Blade Runner-y sci-fi mm-hmm. than anything else. And one of the ideas mm-hmm. early on was Meredith is really brilliant with color and maybe this is a way in which we can bring more of the sci-fi in. Right. Give it more Absolutely. of that neo-noir vibe. We make it feel more like a detective book feels. And that's, I don't know how far you guys have read, but I've been very excited about the places we've been able to go in the book. Mm. You've got the lagoon, which is incredibly organic and yep. beautiful and idyllic, despite the fact that it's crawling with man-eating mermaids. And then you've got <laughs> The castle is incredibly ornate and sort of more old school style. And then like where the people are actually living is more Blade Runner-y and a little shady from place to place. And then the trees, yes, which was my favorite. And then the trees. Yeah. 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 It's Mm -hmm. incredible. And, you know, there, there, I might do a, um, if Meredith gives me permission, I might do a, a post about, me sort of pushing her on colors sometimes because mm-hmm. you know nine times out of ten whatever she turns in you're like oh you're done that's amazing <laughs> every once in a while i'm like i know you can do better <laughs> and i know we can push this usually i mean i don't usually say right. this, but i think that's how she knows me well enough to take it and mm-hmm. when she comes back it's always stronger mm-hmm. it's always better and so it does take a it it does take self-control though to mm-hmm. to recognize when it's already great and not be like well if you ask her for another pass it might get even better because you know mm-hmm. then, then the book never comes out and <laughs> and, and because you don't want to get in your head about when yeah. it's working and when it's not mm-hmm. you know um mm-hmm. But so there are little things. I mean, you were asking about world building stuff. I think a good example is in that scene where they see the kids, where they're up on that overlook above the lagoon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When those pencils came in, you couldn't really tell what she was planning to do with like the fencing on the walkways there. And so I just said, it looks great, whatever. And then she did the colors and it didn't land. It it didn't really work. It, It felt... It felt not only sort of, it didn't even really feel fantasy. It felt more like what you or I would see at Martha's Vineyard if we went there. Like it felt like something from this world, you know? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it was just like slatted fence or whatever. It was just like very normal. And I was like, no. I was like, that's got, if there's any way we can push it to sci fi. And I think Charles, the editor, our editor, said, what about like an energy? Like mm-hmm. you could just make these glowing barriers, and like that was it, and that was that was the thing you needed to take that page from right. a page yeah. that we didn't quite think about enough to making it feel like we thought about every single thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so some yeah. of it really comes organically, I think. I think we have a huge leg up because Meredith naturally is very good at that kind of problem solving. But mm-hmm. you know, as long as you've got everyone sort of paying attention, I think you catch it even when something slips through you know yeah sure it, it's it's always funny to me because you know we we obviously talk a lot and and sort of compare notes and brainstorm stuff um pretty frequently and th- your approach and my approach and i know that i'm an outlier in the way i i handle things with with making comics but i i very much like my scripts are incredibly detailed they're very long they're very, you know, like I have shots, descriptions, I have like camera movement descriptions and, and, you know, body, I, I put in a lot of body language of just people mm. who are in the background and things like that. And then I tell the artists, like, this is just how I see it in my head. Like when I visu- when I write a script, I'm visualizing a page of a comic. Mm-hmm. This is the easiest way for me to get it down and convey mm-hmm. that to you is to just like, I'm translating something I see, do whatever the hell you want. And, you know, take if this is helpful to you, if you if you want real heavy guidance, like if you want a map, like use it. If if you if you don't throw it out and do what you think is best. And from that, I've sort of developed this idea that like in my head and my scripts, the comic is mine. And then when I hand (laughs) it off, the comic is theirs. 
and mm-hmm. like it's not mine anymore and it comes and... back to me and i rewrite it but so i'm very light on notes like i almost never give art notes unless there's like something that literally is wrong it's wrong mm-hmm. for the story contract something but if there's a choice made i don't ever do that and i know that you kelly are very hands-on with your notes mm-hmm. not in a bad way but you're very much believe that like the team should be pushing each other to be better all the time it's i mean that's a nice way to put it it's i think it's yeah you're a terror is what i'm saying yeah, oh, yeah. Oh. no i think i think my hands-onness which is very true um comes from two things being a nightmare and also i don't ever want to give notes late sure i'm happy to give notes on layouts um hey i think you've this character is supposed to be on this page or i don't think we're leaving enough room for dialogue here remember there's that huge speech or whatever like mm-hmm. little stuff like that or you know and and listen i'll give a tragic note later if i miss something or if you know we fucked up but my notes almost never come later because yeah. i am very hands-on when the layouts come in i am looking at every single panel sometimes i'm looking at it with the script if like i'm not worried about it usually that's not necessary and it's really tedious so <laughs> i prefer <laughs> they don't have to do that but yeah um i i'm always shocked when matt's like oh i haven't looked at layouts and i'm like you're nuts why would you i mean on, why would you leave it to chance like that man I mean, on on you know my my most frequent collaborator is tyler boss he doesn't send me anything but finished pages well so that's what i was i i think this sort of goes together first of all i have had that experience and it can work out yeah. that um my first experience with that at marvel was uh stefano caselli for uh mm. west coast avengers and we would just get finished pages and man that had my world view very messed up because mm. that was a very hard to let go of control but honestly he's so good, he's so good. Yeah. and we were very in sync and i think especially because it was early in the west coast avenger stuff my scripts were more detailed mm. and so he really just nailed it there were only a couple little things that i sort of wished we could have gone back and tweaked but for the most part it was incredible i gotta um, reread that book i fucking love that book <laughs> i love yeah, doing that book i love doing that book but so matt when you does does your detail of your script or your handling of it does it change based on you know who you're giving it to like a script for tyler does that have to be as detailed for for you know we can never go home three does that have to be as detailed as wildcats five with a new artist like you know i i i tend to because I jump around with artists so much, you know, the way the way we work, we don't work yeah. with people that long. And like, you know, I've been lucky, you know, like I, I'm on my 20th, 18th issue with Otto Schmidt. And, and you know, I, there are some people I worked with a lot. And Dream come true. Yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, like I did 17 issues of Punisher with Simon Kodransky. And yeah. um, there are some people who I had long runs with. But mostly I start off very intense and then... Yeah. I, I always start off with the most hand holding and then I try and cut it back if they want it cut back. But don't you just leaving. think that's naturally just about trust? I mean, well, what's funny is that I, I said to Tyler once, like, do you want me to scale back? And he was like, no, I really like it. And I was mm-hmm. like, but you don't follow it. And he's like, no, but I like having someone tell me what the vision is. <laughs> and it's <laughs> the, the fact of the matter is when I when I do scale it back, I write the whole script and then I go through and delete like yeah. it's, it's editing yeah. it's not it's yeah. not faster for me to do that it's just a consideration to be like i'm i'm boring my fucking artists with I telling do, i do that more on notes i had a lot of notes for something recently and i wrote them all down and then i went back and i was like okay which are the unreasonable ones let's yeah. come out with <laughs> i mean it's 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 funny like you were talking before about about the editing and the the scaling everything down and and how you know you want to figure out how to scale back when you see the art and how to give the art more room i i'm haunted by in a good way haunted by the anecdote that um a studio went to the coen brothers and begged them to do a director's cut of one of their movies and they came back with a six minute shorter film (laughs) like that to me is like my dream i i 
I love it so much. And I'm like, oh yeah, if I if I could do that, I would never add anything to a comic. I would always yeah. be subtracting myself mm. and I would add pages of art and subtract. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. say nine writing. times out of ten, if you're going back and looking at it, you never want to add a thing. I mean, every once in a while you're like, man, maybe we should have tweaked that for clarity or whatever, but you'd always love to have more space, but that yeah. doesn't mean you want more words, less words. Mm. It's always yeah. about editing down, especially when you look at your older work like when i look at my a4 stuff which was my first big marvel work um i still think it's really fun and i really love it especially the ben caldwell stuff but man i needed i needed to dial some of that back you know so yeah. i would totally go in there with a scalpel and like, take some out if someone let me um <laughs> yeah. i mean so i we fun. We, when Four Kids Walking No Bank finished, we were having a conversation as we were putting the trade together, me and Tyler, and I was like, you know, I wish the emotional beat at the very end hit harder. And Tyler was like, me too. And he was like, I could never figure out how to make it work. And I was like, oh, I think you'd do it like this, but it would take three more pages. And then he was like, fucking i'm doing it and we did three more pages and the, the and the trade so has, awesome. has an extra three pages we never like promoted it because we weren't like hey did you read this in single issues we'll buy it again because it's got a new ending because it's the same ending it's just mm -hmm. done more it's just paced. wow it's just more that. graceful yeah but yeah and so like that was the one thing and i i didn't write anything else like i i i split up what i wrote over those three pages there's no additional dialogue right well that's been my biggest problem on Substack, so maybe it's going to be a problem for you, although you're a little more well-financed than I am in general, not that we want to tell people about our lives, but I keep going I, over I sell my... Drugs. I, <laughs> oh. He's just better with money, guys. Uh, and, uh, uh, I'm not good at it. Anyway, the... Uh, <laughs> I almost made you spit that out. It almost worked. Um, the... Uh, Sorry, I've completely lost track of what I was talking about. You were saying that you're um, jealous of all my money. Oh, oh, I was just saying that I keep going <laughs> over. I keep going over on my issues. I think every mm -hmm. issue has been yeah. more than 20 pages. And it's just because that is so tantalizing. Like the number of times when you're writing corporate comics that have to finish in 20 pages where you're like, I would cut off a limb to get another yeah, yeah. page for this scene mm -hmm. and you can't do it. And now you're like, oh. We just add it. Like as long mm -hmm. as the artist is fine with it, we can just add it. But I keep doing that with every single yeah. one of them. every single subsaf script I've done has been longer. Most of them have been twenty three pages, and that adds up to your budget being fucked. Very oh yeah, I, I I mean so. I just had the conversation with one of my artists. Um, I'm not gonna say who, um, but I think when people look at the work, they'll figure it out. But I uh, we were talking about Tim Sale and and Tim Sale's mm. work, and and my artist was talking about how Tim Sale was so fearless in like knowing when to just do a close up on a face or a close up mm. or like an iconic moment that takes up space. And he was like, I I feel like so much stuff has to be rushed all the time and i'm just so jealous that he finds the way to have that space to do it and i was like you will have the space to do that here like mm -hmm. and he was like well you know it's and i was like no if it if the story needs another page or another two pages like take them we'll find the money we'll, we'll make it work and it was a real like oh like it was it was a real enlightening conversation because yeah. we were both kind of like in love with the idea of just being unrestrained in what we did and just being yeah. like mm -hmm yeah, we can just do that. We can make something as good. And, it, you know, it, it speaks a lot to Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale and their ability to do that in the constraints of a Batman comic or whatever. But having that, not having that ability, not having that hindrance in a in a creator-owned book is so amazing. And so yeah, it's so beautiful different. until I had to look at my budget. But sure. <laughs> can we go back to um, Tyler wanting you to write the script so he can go ahead and do it a different way? Yes. Because mm -hmm. I love that. And it reminds me of my experience on Deadpool with Chris Bocello, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm, who I've been a fan of since I was a teenager. Um, mm -hmm. so just good. like a super fan, dream come true to have him on Deadpool. And, but you know, Chris is a comics god, and I'm right. just Kelly Thompson. So, you know, <laughs> you, you, he's sort of in control there, despite the fact that I am, quote, 
writing the roadmap, end quote. Yeah. So after the first issue, I had to do almost a complete rewrite. I think wow. I did track changes. I did a track changes word document as I was doing it. And I think it was something, I can't remember the number. It was like over 200 track changes. It was insane. Oh. It was crazy. So then, but I was like, well, I want Chris Pichello to be happy. I want him to like me. <laughs> I, I want this to go well. So I'm going to look at what he did with what I gave him. Yeah. And yeah. script two was already being worked on by then. But I'm going to, for script three, I'm going to try to anticipate, like, for example, I would write a big panel with a lot of characters in it. And then he would break it up into four panels with just heads and just a tiny bit of dialogue for each of them. And I'd be like, so I would just do that for him. So I broke it down the way I sort of thought he wanted. Yep. Mm -hmm. He reversed it. He did. <laughs> he still didn't do what I asked. He did his own thing. And so we never really talked about it direct, <laughs> directly. But I think there is something in him. He just wants to create his own, you know, he doesn't yep. want to follow my roadmap. And so even though here I am sort of trying to, anticipate anticipate where. him and 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 create something that he'll really enjoy doing i really think and it's not fair of me to say this because i didn't talk to him about it but my experience i think he he wanted to create his own thing you know yeah. it's not that he didn't want to do it with me but like he saw his part of that as turning it into something different than what i'd put mm -hmm. on the paper and it was a really eye-opening experience for me and it was also, um, you know, I did this uh, interview long time ago where I was saying, like, you know, the formula is your friend until it's not. Like, you have to know. Like, it's to help you get through it. Like, oh, I have this much of this in here and this much of this in here and we need to end with a cliffhanger and we need a rising and falling action. And, like, those are all those things that help you write those issues. Hmm. But you can't just crank out a formula all the time. So you have yeah. to know when to break it and when to do something different and whatever. And working with Chris on Deadpool was one of the best reminders I ever had and one of the best, like, sort of wake-up calls to, like, not get comfortable in that formula and to make sure you're pushing on things. And I'll always appreciate that run short as it was for, hmm. and, and Chris for sort of reminding me about all that and like teaching me a lesson about working with others. Like just cause you think you're doing the right thing, you know, I mean, this, yeah. this story should surprise no one who knows me well. My partner says the Thompson family are constant overhelpers. So, of course, I tried to overhelp Chris Pacello, the comics god. Into <laughs> no, I, I, have the same, <laughs> I have the same exact sort of relationship with Otto. Um, when we were doing Hawkeye, I, oh, I, I was like, I want to give him three mm. panel pages and let him go nuts. And yeah. he would add all these little panels. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I can do that. And so then I went through and like, I remember turning in a script and Alana, my editor was like, one of these is a 12 panel page. And I was like, yeah, but he wants to do that stuff. And then he turned it in and it was 17 panels. <laughs> and I was, like, oh. <laughs> I was like, okay, so he's just like upping it. No matter what but, but Otto is so funny because he like adds all this stuff. I It takes me longer to do lettering passes of his books than anything else I work on because he has very unique expressions and moments that he captures. Mm -hmm. And I write a lot of dialogue yeah. and there'll be a panel where I'll be like, that is definitely this character saying that line. And so I have to like deconstruct the entire page to be like, what did he think? If, yeah. if this is this yeah. point on the page, what is this why is this and <laughs> and like it's always like i feel like it's like um like some kind of da vinci code thing where i stare yeah. at it and i'm like what the hell did he do here <laughs> and then like i get that one piece where i'm like oh he's laughing that's that him giving that that's line. it and work backwards do you work and, backwards a lot oh yeah i yeah, have to work same. backwards all the time same. and then everything like eventually just like shifts and fits yeah. and you're like oh it's beautiful like yeah, it's yeah. so cool yeah, oh you're God. like okay i have to get this joke in this panel so let's work backward from there to see how we get there and like listen yeah. those are a pain in the ass especially because inevitably they come in at you know midnight and yeah. someone would really like to see 
it tomorrow morning or something. And you're like, sure. really? Because this is a two hour lettering pass I got to yeah. do now. So it's, it's sometimes a pain in the ass, but it's honestly one of my favorite things. It's mm. one of the times I feel most like a writer of mm. when I can take something beautiful that someone has turned in that is not quite the thing that I wrote and I can see how we can get there, mm. but we need to make some tweaks to make it really sing. And that's my job to come in and, and take what, you know, he, they took what I built and they made it sing. And now it's my job to take it back and make it even better. And it honestly is one of the things that pisses me off the most when I see people being lazy about that in comics uh, as writers, I will say in fairness to writers, that's sometimes a multi you know there's sometimes you want to blame multiple people for that like maybe it's you didn't get a chance to look at something when it was fit you know because of deadlines or whatever so i try not to be too hard about it but i just sent matt we won't say what it is but i just sent him the other day something that i screenshotted him because i was like this is so fucking lazy it makes me so mad Mm -hmm. where like the clearly nobody went in and like saw that oh these characters aren't doing what was written and now we didn't bother to fix it like Mm -hmm. i hate that shit it makes me very upset about comics because i don't know it's like i know that comics gets outside of us obviously outside of the fandom like it's just not treated seriously as a medium often enough and it Mm -hmm. makes me mad and i feel like stuff like that it's not why because people who don't treat it seriously as a medium don't really know it they don't understand it they haven't they haven't walked around inside of it but it's stuff like that that they think is happening all the time that they think Mm -hmm. is lazy and not quality right so Mm -hmm. i I always have a problem with that stuff yeah it's really interesting um i think that about brings us to the end (laughs) maybe even i'd say no no this was perfect this was no, yeah absolutely. no this was this was great ended on a super fun note too super like fun. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. crescendo yeah this is this is why everybody hates us and <laughs> fuck them and <laughs> good night everybody uh, yeah. the no i i i would just say that you know kelly it was lovely to have you here and hear your thoughts on black cloak i i i'm sure that when this podcast keeps going uh, you'll see that I'm hyperbolically kind to everyone who comes on here and tells them that their work is super important and nice. But actually, your book really did sort of shock me in how much I love it. And uh, as a fan of yours, it's still sort of I was like, oh, this is this isn't Kelly doing good work on Captain Marvel and Black Widow and and winning Eisner's and being great. Like this is it. This is like a work that is going to really be people's favorite comic of all time mm. is like, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. I, and, and he, and he means this one, but none of the ones, it, after none of the this ones one. after this, you'll be like, I'm not sure when he said that exact same thing <laughs> to, to Donnie next week. I'm sure that, that I mean, you really should do like a, like an old school joke where you just say that same compliment, but just audio in, <laughs> your name mm. uh uh you know donnie's book whoever's book that you've yeah. got on you know but uh, i really think you've got a classic on your hands here donnie Cates. yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's not, it's not even my, it's not even my voice <laughs> yeah, <it's not> <laughs> someone <laughs> else comes in it's one of ours we're gonna do yeah. it in both there's a great john mulaney book where uh joke where uh a woman some kid at a wedding when your veil gets pulled up he goes oh she's ugly and it's, on the, it's on the videotape and he's like you know you hope the guy came in later and he was like she's beautiful she's a vision in white like bad audio version. that's the plan yeah um, that's this whole podcast is going to be that we're bringing in another host <laughs> to yeah. <be> me um <laughs> kelly we, did did you uh the, the floor is yours did you have anything that you wanted to plug yours or otherwise no man i'm excited thanks for having me on i can't wait for people to see what matt's gonna do and mm-hmm. um i can't wait to get the rest of my stuff out there but man it's taken a while yeah quick where can the people find you on substack Substack is 1979 semifinalist.substack.com. Mm. 
keep it keep it and, as easy as we can without having anything to do with my name it's great. Okay. i like it's it a great, yeah. great system it's it's vague it's a little confusing it's got the numbers in it it's got numbers. It's, mm-hmm. it sounds it's like maybe it's your it's password to your email it's great. or the year i was born that's when i get all the time um oh, yeah, no, i mean the elves are in finalist yeah right uh kelly thompson is just a really boring name that too many people have and by the time i came around to it you know all the good kelly thompson stuff was snapped up i went to the dmv last week and she was like oh a lot of kelly thompson's this will take them i was like Jesus. Oh, fuck. <laughs> you didn't have to say it yeah right she's trying to <sighs> it's insulting anyway so yeah well, thanks for having me on guys of thank course. you thank so you much And that brings us to the end of part two of our discussion with Kelly Thompson. Make sure you head over to 1979semifinalist.substack.com to see everything that Kelly Thompson and her wonderful collaborators are cooking up for you. To get the latest episodes of this podcast, as well as access to news, giveaways, and even comics from Team Ashcan Press delivered straight to your inbox, go to ashcanpress.com and sign up for the newsletter. We will be back next week with another wonderful guest. And in the meantime, write to us at ideasdontbleedpod at gmail.com or tweet to Matthew at Ashcan Press me at tales to astonish or griffin at griff sheridan we'll include some of your correspondence on the show and we'd love to hear what you have to say and big thanks to summer people for our theme song where's the poison thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time